Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here tonight. And again, this is the second time we're live in St. Paul. So St. Paul, we're, we're glad to have you here. And would love to receive a phone call or with comments or questions about the show um, or the subject matter that we're talking about today. In order to do that, you can call in at 651-747-3838. If you don't like calling in, uh, you can email us at speechlessmn at gmail.com and uh, give us show suggestions, uh, what you like, what you don't like, you got some concerns, whatever. Uh, I'm not going to promise you I'm going to get to them. <laughs> you know, other shows say they will. I don't know that I will, but uh, usually they get read within a month or so. Uh, but if you want to see past shows, uh, go to youtube.com backslash speechlessmn or Google Speechless and my name, Tim Kinley, and a lot of my shows will come up there. Uh, but anyway, St. Paul, it's glad to have you live again. And um, I have a special guest on today that will uh, come on in a little bit, but uh, Attorney Greg Wurzel, uh, who's ran for the Minnesota Supreme Court. We're going to go through a lot of the history of our judicial system in Minnesota, a number of the court cases that he's been with trying to be a candidate for the Minnesota Supreme Court. And then what's happening in our legislature now, an attempt by a number of people to take away your right to vote for judges. And either way, it's a taking away of a right to vote. And we're going to discuss the, some of the ins and outs and why that should not happen, why you should always retain your right to vote for a judge. So we definitely would like you to hear your comments and questions that you may have about, about that subject matter. Um, so before we get into that, I have some updates. Uh, of course, we've been working on the bullying bill, uh, common core curriculum, judges signing their oath of office, legislature, we've been dealing with child support, and uh, unfortunately, one of a former representative, Steve Smith, passed away um, this week at age 64. And he was a person that uh, um, we didn't see eye to eye on. And, uh, but I know that uh, the people around him, the representatives around him, like Representative Eastland, uh, cared about this man deeply. Uh, they knew he had alcohol problems. And uh, at one point in time, he had it licked. And, but I think this last election, when he didn't get endorsed by the party and lost in the primary, may have sent him down a, a, a downward spiral. Uh, and it's, it's too bad. Uh, uh, but anyway, his, according to the paper, um, the father battled alcohol, alcoholism and became increasingly despondent and unresponsive to calls from family and friends according to his son, and that's his son, Ryan Smith, told the Associated Press. That came out of the Star Tribune. And um, so he did a tremendous amount of work on child support reform in the legislature. Um, and of course, you know I've criticized him greatly um, because he just was a roadblock towards any uh, increasing time for fathers with their kids. And good father, just, it just didn't matter. Uh, and he had his battles that he had, and, and unfortunately, he passed away. And so I uh, just wanted to give that announcement and uh, pray for his family uh, as they uh, go through this time and, and their loss. And, and as I've just lost my dad recently, um, you know, it's just it's not a fun thing to go through, uh, and especially when some, a parent has been having problems. Uh, so, just want to update there. Uh, interesting thing came out, you know, so much that happens in the legislature, we just don't hear about because uh, press doesn't cover it or we're not paying attention. <laughs> it's just very easy to ignore. But last year, I believe, the campaign fire, or, well, I don't know when, but I think the, yes, this last year, the campaign finance laws were changed so that now state representatives can raise up to $60,000 or thereabouts when it used to be $33,000. But one of the little things that they put in their, the game of bag of tricks for raising money, let's say you want have a certain candidate and uh, that candidate can have 
12 people give him or her a thousand dollars okay say the 13th person comes in and says well I want to give a thousand dollars they're capped at five hundred dollars really really bizarre so a couple uh, Republican uh, house members are going to sue on that issue um, and saying that's just a denial of uh, free speech rights for the 13th person. So Linda Runbeck and Scott Dutcher, uh, they teamed up with the Institute for Justice, a nonprofit public interest law firm to challenge <laughs> uh, that, that law as well they should. And I bring that up because we're also going to talk about Greg, some of Greg Worsell's case about campaign finance and what campaign laws and how a lot of these laws are, are there to restrict people from uh, their freedom of speech. And, okay, U.S. Supreme Court decided not to hear the Me New Mexico Supreme Court case when a photographer was forced, was being forced, was sued because she refused to for, uh, do photos for a, a, a homosexual or gay marriage a wedding. And so that photographer was sued, lost in the New Mexico Supreme Court, went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they decided not to hear the bill, uh, which then really denies religious freedom for a business person, denies freedom of association based on a behavior. Not, you know, it's not like a civil rights thing where you have an immutable characteristics like the color of your skin. It's just the way you are, the way you're born. It's immutable versus a behavior. And so th this is just outrageous in my mind. Um, but I think there may be one reason they chose not to hear this case is because they're dealing with the Hobby Lobby case. And that decision is going to come down fairly soon. And then that case may then overturn the New Mexico case. But this person is out of luck. So whatever they had to pay in fines uh, for this person. And right now in New Mexico, if you have any faith uh, that doesn't value the homosexual lifestyle, the homosexual behavior, you're going to have to service that uh, industry. So we'll see what comes up with that, but maybe the Hobby Lobby case will uh, turn all that over. Who knows? Um, also, the anti-bullying bill passed, and we've talked about this on the show in the past. Governor Dayton signed it today. I, I believe he signed it today. Here, here's the thing with that. This is, the, this is the biggest destructive piece of legislature, in my opinion, what it did with the gay marriage, uh, homosexual marriage, it gave teeth, it gave a power to that bill to criminalize people who don't believe in homosexual marriage or gay marriage. This is all about the gay, lesbian, transgender community, bisexual community, and uh, not having people speak out against them. If you have a church that is in a public school you can be shut down and kicked out of that school because your religious viewpoints are against homosexuality. That's, that's in this bill. You as a parent no longer have uh, parental rights. Do, they will be taken away. You, have not, you don't have control or due process rights over your kids. Plus, one of the, if you watch the legislature, it was unbelievable the debate that went on on the Republican side. They gave information after information about what this bill was about, and it was fascinating. If it wasn't, if you couldn't see it on TV, which you could, I'd say it was better than watching t any TV show. <laughs> this was a fascinating debate, and I'm really proud of the Republican Party and the people that spoke up against this bill. There's just a much way to, better way to do that than to protect one class of people. This did not protect everybody. It's pro protecting a particular class. It's denying due process rights for a child who's been accused of uh, bullying. Parents don't even get to know. They don't get to be involved in this process unless they find out somehow. And it's going to be a nightmare. Uh, so. 
that's that's my updates. Next week on the show, we're going to have Dan Severson, who's running for Secretary of State. Uh, and we're going to hear what his uh, agenda is, what his goals are as Secretary of State. So watch in again next Thursday night at 8 o'clock on uh, this very same channel and hope to see you then. But today, I want to introduce my guest, uh, Greg Wurzel. Okay. Greg, thanks for coming on the show and being my here. Pleasure. Uh, you are really making one of my producers very, very happy. <laughs> He's been on my case <laughs> to get you on the show for years, and it just somehow it just hasn't worked out. So I'm glad to have you today. My pleasure. Yeah. So you're uh, you would be described as uh, a very litigious person. <laughs> well, I practiced law for over 30 years. It's kind of hard to not be litigious if you're an attorney. Well, exactly, you know, and, and, and I, I go, I sit in a lot of courtrooms and hear a lot of things, and I hear about the, the other attorney that doesn't like a person will say, oh, this attorney is very litigious, you know. Well, of course, that's what you do, you know. But uh, you have a lot of lawsuits. You've been very involved. You ran for the Minnesota Supreme Court. Yeah, uh, how many times and why? <laughs> uh, I've lost count. Uh, um, well, why? I guess it's because I thought our judges uh, at that time. Uh, you got to go way back in history. I'm I'm showing how old I am, but mm -hmm. I I started this back in 1996, uh, and at the time I thought the Minnesota Supreme Court was way off track on lots of things they were doing, but one of the things they were doing is at the time I was practicing a lot of criminal defense work, doing a lot of criminal law, and uh, you could see a whole series of criminal cases being decided by the Minnesota Supreme Court, which were just kind of off the edge. Mm. Uh, they were creating criminal rights that no other states had. Hmm. Uh, and I thought that if the people of Minnesota would know about this, right. they'd be concerned and perhaps throw some of these people out of office. Okay. Uh, the problem becomes when you want to run for this office, the first thing I found out is, is that I couldn't state my views on a legal or political issue because the judges had created a rule, an ethical rule, uh -huh. that prohibited that kind of conduct. And if I would have stated my views, I could have lost my license to practice law. They would have said it was unethical conduct. So that was, so the first problem I had was trying to figure out how do you talk about these things without stating your own views. So you, could, you couldn't even raise the issues that were important to you, that were important to justice, and tell people about what was taking place in the judiciary. Well, exactly, and I thought they were the very issues that the public needed to hear about. These, so, uh, and, and that's the reason to run for an office, is because well, there, you think there's a, an issue that needs to be discussed by the public. Well, who's left to tell the story I mean, if the press isn't telling the story, who's left to tell it? Well, again, normally it's going to be the, the candidate who runs against the incumbent, who's mm -hmm. going to say, this is what's going on, ladies and gentlemen. You need to make a decision. Mm -hmm. um, and when you find out you can't state your views on a legal or political issue, when the whole issue is about the law, uh, this becomes an impossible task. So what you're left with talking about uh, according to the rule, if you were going to stay within the rule, was you could state your name, where you went okay. to law school, uh, how long you practiced law. Of yourself. Yeah, as, as if that's a reason for somebody to vote for you. And it uh -huh. might be to some tiny extent, but that's not what people want to hear about. And um, so I, I was a little creative. I had to find creative ways to deal with these things. And so um, I uh, started telling people uh, what the majority had decided. Oh. And what the dissent had said. <laughs> so it wasn't my words. Right. Uh, but I said, what I was trying to point out to people was, hey, there are dissenting judges out there. Things don't have to be this way. Okay. And we need to elect different judges. Now, I never said which, which way I was going to go. Right. Uh, but, of course, that was kind of inferred. Sure. Uh, and the judges thought I was being a little too successful. Oh. Because uh, I was speaking at the time mm -hmm. to... Uh, Republican Party groups, and I was seeking their endorsement, and uh, so they created new rules. Okay. Uh, and the new rules were that you couldn't, uh, I could no longer attend or speak at a political party gathering. Uh, I could no longer seek a political party endorsement. Uh, 
and then they had various rules about uh, money and uh, these kinds of things. So that that's when we yeah. the the party got involved and we started a lawsuit. Okay. Well, the the first thing that really, you know, when I first heard about this, I'm going, wow, a judiciary that's supposed to know our constitution has forgotten about free speech. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like it doesn't exist for a, a person running for judge or a judge or, and then even attorneys, there's a rule, isn't there a rule that attorneys can't criticize the courts? To, yeah, to you're, you're, you're treading on very dangerous ground okay. when you start <laughs> right. uh, taking in, uh, if you bring uh, disrepute on the court. Okay. Uh, yeah. And disrepute is different than speaking against them, isn't it? Well, again, uh, understand. <laughs> it's a gray area. Who, well, who controls the rules and yeah. who controls the enforcement of the rules? It's the judges. Right. And uh, that's the problem. Uh, you got the, the problem is anytime you have a gray area, that's going to infringe on free speech. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to have a, 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 a clear line in the, in the sand mm -hmm. that you can say this, you can't say that. Mm -hmm. But when you start having gray areas, you nobody's going to try to uh, cross those either. Uh, and so you've now infringed okay. speech that probably shouldn't be infringed or maybe shouldn't be infringed on is being, is being prohibited, mm -hmm. e essentially. And that's part of, the, part of the problems with having these kinds of rules that are written vague with vague terms. Well, and that's probably part of the intent is to be uh, vague with it. The other thing that... Uh, what was amazing in this process is that I'd done a little research and I'm finding judge were, judges, people running for judge, were getting endorsed. Uh, unions oh, yeah. or special interest groups. So the endorsement, it wasn't a problem of being able to be endorsed, right? Because you're they haven't changed right. that role, right? You're that absolutely never right. Changed. You're absolutely right. Uh, judges were commonly endorsed. Uh, by uh, unions, especially police unions, uh, they were uh, and uh, various labor unions. Uh, they would seek the you could seek the endorsement of any single issue interest group. So you could seek the endorsement of a Planned Parenthood or NARAL uh -huh. or uh, a pro-life group. But mm -hmm. they created a rule that said you couldn't seek the endorsement of a political party. And if you think about it, what's the one group that has statewide uh, application, has the ability to elect candidates statewide. And get information And out. get information right. out to the public. It's a political party. Right. So that's why they were after the political parties. That's why they wanted to stop me, because they were afraid that somebody might actually, I think, they were afraid that uh, somebody might actually make the election system work, mm -hmm. where an incumbent would get defeated. Well, I mean, that, <laughs> now you raise a whole other issue there with the word incumbent, but yep. we'll come to that later. Uh, but so that's really sig s singling out one specific association of people. Right. Other associations, yeah, you have freedoms, but this association here, no freedoms. Correct. You can't, you can't do what other associations can do. And that's why the Republican Party was outraged. And, okay. and joined me in the litigation. So you had a lawsuit. Right. Okay, and that started in the Minnesota It started courts. in the Minnesota federal courts. Not oh, the really? State. Yeah, we oh. stayed away from the state courts. Um, this is White, uh, Republican Party of Minnesota versus White. Yeah, that's the okay. name of the case, the Republican Party of Minnesota versus White. Okay. Um, and um, it, uh, we filed it in... They, they, they created that rule about you, that you couldn't attend or speak at political party uh, conventions uh -huh. on January of uh, 1997 or 98, okay. 98, 98. Okay. And we started the litigation in March of 98. All right. Uh, and then it uh, slowly uh, wound its way up through the federal court system. We finally got a decision from the uh, U.S. Supreme Court in 2002 Okay. Uh, and that's what most people think of uh, when they hear the, if they've heard of the case, the Republican Party of Minnesota versus White. And the, the U.S. Supreme Court hit, we had raised like five issues. They took just one issue, uh, which was what they called the announce clause. It was that, uh, that rule that said the judicial candidate couldn't state his views on legal or political issues. Okay. And uh, they said the, the U.S. Supreme Court determined that was unconstitutional. 
Uh, so infringement that, of free speech. Okay. You can state your views. Can state your views. All right. And then they took all the other issues and referred them back down to the Eighth Circuit to uh, review in light of their decision okay. on the uh, announce clause. All right. So, I mean, you had a whole nother. So you won on the announce clause, but had to go back to the Eighth Circuit to right. address these other issues. Right. And, and then we got a decision in 2006 from the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, and we won on all the remaining issues. So the other issues were, uh, there was the, the rule that prohibited judicial candidates from attending uh, political party gatherings. That was struck down so as unconstitutional. Just, so a political party just goes and says, I mean, they have events all the time. Right. You couldn't even show up. Couldn't show up. Couldn't attend. Couldn't speak. I could go to the Lions. I could go to, like I said, NARAL. I could uh -huh. go to any other group and speak to them, but not a political party event. Uh, just insanity. Yeah, uh, definitely. There, uh, the rule that said that uh, political parties, I couldn't seek, use, or accept a political party endorsement. That was struck down as unconstitutional. Uh, and there was a rule that said I couldn't uh, personally solicit campaign funds, and that was struck down mm -hmm. as an unconstitutional infringement of free speech. Mm -hmm. And there was one more rule, and for the life of me, I can't think of it off the top of my head. <laughs> but yeah. that was struck down as well. <laughs> but and, and that case is commonly known as it's, it's entitled the Republican Party of Minnesota versus White, but most people call it White 2. White, okay. okay. The Eighth Circuit is White 2. Exactly. Okay, and that had, it had no place in the Minnesota Supreme Court. They didn't hear any of this, or, or the Minnesota courts didn't hear any of these issues. No, okay. no. But, it, but while the litigation was going on, the Minnesota Supreme Court continued to tinker they were with the rules, the ethical rules, Based on what they were hearing and what exactly, was coming through. Exactly, because they kept trying to change things. And so the, as we're trying to argue the case, they're always tinkering with the rules, changing the rules, seeing if they can't somehow uh, manufacture something that uh, uh, still restricts right. campaign conduct but would somehow muster constitutional uh, authority. Right. right. <laughs> well, that, that's what... Uh, Another amazing aspect of this case is this once you won all these things, first of all, they made all these rules. These yeah. are you know, just outrageous rules. They, they made them. S somebody's, some mindset is going on there that's really, really severe. They just did not want anybody e exploring this area. Right. And, right. Then, and then once you won them all, they changed the they rules. They changed again. the rules again. Yes. So what what <laughs> rule did they change? <laughs> well, what they did is uh, the uh, one rule was struck down uh, that said uh, judicial candidates couldn't personally solicit campaign funds. Uh -huh. So they created a new rule that said judicial candidates can personally solicit campaign funds as long as there are twenty or more people in the audience. Uh -huh. Now, what I always told people is 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 when there was the announce clause. Right. I needed a surrogate candidate to go everywhere I would go. Yeah. And so I wouldn't be able to say anything but my name, but the, I would have the surrogate candidate okay. who would say my views, right? Okay. <laughs> sure. Now, now, if you think about it, they created this rule about having 20 people. Now you need that 19 people, people to follow to you around. With you. So that if you really want to ask the one for money, uh, you can do that. Uh, and then you get into these silly, ga I've been in gatherings where people are walking in and out. Uh -huh. And you have 20, and then you lose the 20, sure. and then they come back. And, <laughs> and the question becomes, you know, now at the very second you asked, uh, were there 20 people in the room? Wow. Can you count the waitress who walked in? Uh, you know, I, again, it's ridiculous. Um, we, don't, we don't restrict uh, any other uh, campaign, any other political activity in this kind of a way. So what do you think the intent was in this? I mean, oh, because oh, I'll tell 20... You. 20 people, you know, that's a lot of people. Yeah. You so. need to know how the judges raise money. Oh, how do judges raise money? <laughs> well, okay. see, that, then the rule makes perfect sense. All right. Because the way the judges raise money is they go to the largest law firms mm -hmm. in the metro area in St. Paul and Minneapolis uh, where there's maybe 100 to 150 lawyers. Okay. And they gather them down into a room. The judge comes down and says, I need money. And then they collect the money. Hmm. 
But you see, they can get 20 people in the sure. room and they can get 100 bucks from yeah. each of them or 200 or 500 or 1,000. Yeah. Uh, and that's all permissible. But when I want to ask my next door neighbor if they'll mm. contribute to my campaign, it's prohibited. Well, you need to get 19 other people. When I go to my neighbor's house. Yeah. Yep. So exactly. how did that work when you were asking a campaign donation from your wife? <laughs> well, again, uh, that's... That, that is why, again... I mean, that's one they, of your great when, lies. <laughs> I, I, when, when, they start, when, they started, when they first started uh, creating this rule, uh -huh. uh, we brought that up. In the, some of the litigation was still going on in front of the Eighth Circuit. Uh, we were arguing that it said you couldn't ask for money at all. And I said, well, it means I can't even ask money for my wife. I can't ask money from my family members. And so then they started actually trying to carve out exceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. they, so that, and then finally... Like I said, e uh, even though the rule was struck down, then they created the rule about the, the 20 people. Those, those various exceptions are in there yet Okay. They, they had, that they had carved out. All right. Well, we're going to get to a little bit more on that case, but we have a caller here. Caller, do you have a comment or question? Thanks for calling. Thanks for this show. Thanks for your hard work on this, Greg. Uh, I think you need to write a book on this issue. <laughs> My question is about the... The Eighth Circuit, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeal. Where was the chief on that? Loken, Loken. Where did he ever talk about what he thought about this? And who were your other allies on the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeal? Thank you. Oh my. Um, we 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 on this show have a history with <laughs> Judge Loken. So okay. I, to be honest with you, uh, I'm not sh sure where Judge Loken was. Okay. Um, and uh, we did have one judge who was kind of uh, uh, fighting for us, uh, it seemed, uh, uh, along the way, uh, who had actually written a powerful uh, dissent from the, we originally lost in front of the Eighth Circuit and had written an, a powerful dissent that I think got us into the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay. And um, that judge is now retired and no longer on the Eighth Circuit. And, and I, I hate to tell you this, but I can't remember his okay. name. Okay. Um, but... Um, I get, it, you know, it just shows you again the power of judges, uh, how much they they control, even even of uh, simple issues like this. Right. We finally won, and if you think about it, we won in front of the U.S. Supreme Court on a five to four vote, uh, and one of those one off, yeah. Yep, and one of those votes was Sandra Day O'Connor, and she's regretting that and, decision. And, and isn't if she? You, yes, if you <laughs> she's so if you apologetic read, anywhere she, she goes. Yep, she <laughs> now says the one decision she regrets in her in her. Uh, career as a jurist is is the decision in the white case yeah well you've had a big influence on her wife <laughs> she's living with all this guilt now because of you <laughs> well wow, okay i didn't know free speech would cause guilt but <laughs> well yes it, it does it does and of course that may be bullying too uh if exercising free speech uh so well okay well this is going quick um, real quickly, summarize these other cases that you've had before the Minnesota Supreme Court. This one on the 20 people in the courtroom, excuse or 20, me, not Minnesota Supreme Court, but your lawsuits. Yeah. 20, 20 to people yeah, yeah, in order to collect yeah. money. You, you sued on that issue. Right, yeah. We uh, saw, uh, pursued another federal case uh, trying to have that struck down, um, and uh, that was unsuccessful. Um, we got uh, to a, uh, a decision in front of the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, and it was we lost by one vote. So, um, and we then asked for cert in front of the U.S. Supreme Court again, and it was denied. Mm -hmm. So, um, right now that rule still stands. Okay. Uh, then we had uh, pursued some litigation, uh, trying to get rid of the word incumbent on the ballot. Mm -hmm. uh, that word incumbent uh, definitely creates a benefit for the incumbent. Uh, when people go in to vote and they don't have any other information but see one candidate's the incumbent, uh -huh. uh, that's going to sway uh, probably a good 5% of the vote, maybe more. Well, and one of the arguments is, uh, well, it actually sways people against a candidate because yeah. anti-incumbency. My point is you shouldn't be doing it swaying one way or the other. <laughs> It doesn't matter which way you sway, don't sway. <laughs> right, right, exactly. You know, exactly. Just take it off, don't give that information. Uh, the candidates need to get the word out. Right. And oh, that case, uh, it was more procedural, I think, the reason it failed than okay. anything. 
the uh, attorney who was involved in it, uh, representing me, had originally filed a separate case in state court and okay. lost, and then not, hadn't appealed that. Okay. And then when this case got filed, uh, they said uh, in federal court, uh, they said that uh, <coughs> this issue had already been litigated uh, in the state court system that it should have been properly appealed into okay. the federal court from there and that we couldn't br bring a new case. And, so, but you weren't uh, part of that is state, case in the state court. So I this was a completely different case. Same issues, but different parties. Well, well one party's the one same. One party was the same, and that's what they used. And again, I'm sitting there going, hey, I wasn't a party to the state court action. Huh. My issues were never handled. I want to have this heard. and. Uh, again, that was just kind so of was forgotten. There you are again. Hey, I'm over here. Don't ignore me. <laughs> and right, right. You just get shut down again. Yeah. Uh, okay. So that that's too bad. I I mean that's uh, there was an effort in the Minnesota legislature to take away. Uh, there was a bill uh, introduced to take away the word incumbent, uh, but that didn't go uh, anywhere either. Um, and actually, the chief author killed it himself. Oh. That's an interesting lesson to learn about the legislature and choosing who's going to push the bill. Because some people, some of these legislators take the bill in order to control it so it will die. I see. Sure. Uh, you know, and it's a hard lesson to learn for some of the, uh, you know, people that are new to the system. And I just had some friends... Uh, uh, had that happen to them this year. So <laughs> they actually got a hearing and the chief author voted against her own bill. Oh, my. So, oh my. Taurus, Senator Taurus Ray. And that's, you know, it's a big serious issue about building schools on Superfund dump sites. You know, it's a health issue. But, okay. So, well, you know, we're going to switch here and uh, go into this judicial constitutional amendment that's right. being pushed that would only have judges appointed. Right. And to lead that off, I'm going to have uh, testimony here of Bob Auden, uh, who spoke at a hearing this year. So we're going to hear what he has to say. It's about five, five and a half minutes. But he raises some very good points, and then that will just kind of get us going on uh, on this discussion. And remember, people from St. Paul, we're live, we're new from live. Be the first person to call in with a comment or question from St. Paul. We'd appreciate that. All right, so let's uh, hear what Bob Auden has to say about this uh, judicial appointment bill. Bob Auden, I'm uh, representing the Libertarian Party of Minnesota. Um, we find this to be a very dangerous bill. Uh, the problem that seems to be correcting this is that it's trying to assist voters because voters don't vote for judges. But when you go to the, the, the problem really is is that our judges are appointed rather than elected, even though we have this so-called election. Uh, the governor appoints them midterm. Uh, the judges don't complete their term. And then when they come up for election at, at the next election cycle, uh, we have the word incumbent on the ballot. And no lawyer wants to run against an incumbent because if they lose, there's going to be retribution. So that's why there's no one else on the ballot. Uh, and people really don't want to vote for these positions because they don't know anything about them. Uh, if uh, the Minnesota Supreme Court would simply allow information uh, to be uh, given to the public, well, then this, uh, this could be remedied. Uh, the, uh, and we know that this does work because in this last election cycle, uh, where there was an actual open seat created, so there was no incumbent judge, we had about 25 people running for that slot. Uh, so you don't have just the one person running, you had a whole slew of people running. Uh, and people did know about these judges. They got up, they were able to talk about themselves to some extent. Uh, and, and, and that's good, that's a check and balance on the judiciary. Because we know that there are people out there, uh, and, and since the Minnesota <coughs> Supreme Court has lost cases concerning elections here in Minnesota, 
at the U.S. Supreme Court, we know they're not particularly good at interpreting the Constitution. Uh, otherwise, they would have lost these cases. Mr. Uh, Odin, I'd encourage you, just as I did previous testifiers, to keep your comments directed to the bill, please. Well, I am, because the Minnesota Supreme Court here is, is going to be helping to determine who the judges are going to be, uh, how they're going to be evaluated. Uh, and they have a bias. I mean, judges are simply politicians in black robes. <coughs> So they're going to be, among other politicians, determining exactly who we're, we're going to have for judges. And uh, you know, if they don't like somebody's opinion, uh, like say they, uh, they know somebody's for the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, well, they're, they're simply never going to be sitting on the courts. The court will be stacked. Uh, was it, and they're going to give preferences, like say, to minorities. Well. Minorities vote Democrat. Uh, so th these people are going to be uh, uh, basically uh, hold the uh, opinions of the, the Democrat Party. Uh, and I certainly know that libertarians will never be included among minorities. Uh, the judicial performance evaluation, which has to be approved by the Minnesota Supreme Court, I mean, it's all subjective. Uh, the uh, what was it, being punctual? I mean, that's really laughable. Or the uh, uh, communication skills? Uh, you know, the, the real problem is, is, is just simply, uh, is, is the uh, Minnesota Supreme Court. Uh, if they would simply allow us to have free judicial elections in the state of Minnesota, then we would have uh, voters that were informed. We would have uh, people that would actually be voting on these positions. Uh, and I know that the, this amendment is being considered because the Minnesota Supreme Court has lost at the U.S. Supreme Court. And, and so they want to rectify that by passing this amendment so that it can go back to the old way of doing things where uh, judges didn't have to uh, uh, run for re-election. They were appointed based on campaign contributions or whatever. Uh, it's all about power, uh, money, and control. Uh, and I strongly urge the committee here to uh, uh, vote this amendment down. Okay, uh, Bob raises a lot of issues there, but let's just talk about first, what is this constitutional amendment about? this uh, appointment versus election. What are they trying to accomplish by getting this constitutional amendment passed? Yeah. Uh, well, what they're trying to do is prevent real elections from happening. Again, uh, we had a system for many years here where basically all the judges have been appointed. Mm -hmm. uh, and that in part happens because the judges purposefully create open seats by resigning before the end of their term. Uh -huh. Right. Then the governor appoints to fill that position, and then the next person gets to run as an incumbent. So uh, the people and they get the word incumbent. And they get the word the incumbent name. behind their name, and the people are denied the ability to fill an open seat. When we do have an open seat, suddenly there's 20 candidates. Suddenly there's information out to the voters, and the public gets really in, in, involved in these. And I think uh, is well served by those kinds of elections. But that's the last thing that the judges want. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, again, what they're doing is they're trying to create a system where all the judges are appointed mm -hmm. and then would only stand for what's called a retention election. In a retention election, the uh, public either votes to keep the judge or to remove the judge. If mm -hmm. they vote to remove the judge, then the governor appoints somebody again. And in fact, the governor could appoint the same person again. That, there's, no, there's no, there's no, no prevention of that, huh? <laughs> so, wow. uh, or somebody of, sim let's just say, somebody of similar ilk. So um, you have to ask yourself, why, why do you want to do this? Why, why do you think the governor is more capable? Uh, why not allow the public to select their judges? Uh, this is sometimes called the Missouri Plan, and I can give you a little history about what happened in Missouri and why sure, they created it there. Yeah, why don't you do uh, that? It, after Reconstruction... Uh, the citizens of Missouri uh, created uh, two 
systems to elect their judges. For the less educated here, can you tell us what Reconstruction was? Oh, sure, was? sure. Reconstruction, <laughs> after that, the that, Civil War, <laughs> after the Civil War, we had what was called Reconstruction, okay. where, where the states that were uh, rebels, right, were allowed back into the Union, but they had okay. to do various things. And one of the, th they had to uh, start allowing blacks to vote and these kinds of things. Okay. So uh, th there was a big push in the uh, South at the time to try to figure out how to prevent blacks from mm -hmm. having political power through the, the power of vote. And uh, Missouri came up with a, a du dual system and uh, for electing their judges. They had one system where the judges are elected in normal elections, mm -hmm. and they had another system where the judges were appointed and then stood for retention elections. Wow. And what you found out is, is that where the white people lived in the rural areas, that was the normal election system, and they created this appointment and retention election system to serve the urban areas where the blacks were living. And that allowed the majority of whites to elect the governor who would then select the judges to uh, for those areas where, where the blacks where's were. Where's Jesse Jackson? Where's Al Sharpton on this issue? I mean, that's, hu <laughs> that's huge. It, it's I, I it's insanity. I mean, but that's what they did. And now they're trying to bring that same concept to Minnesota. I mean, when, when we start talking about what they're trying to do is they're trying to take away a civil right. Mm -hmm. That's what your right to vote is. It is a civil right. And right. understand that in the state of Minnesota, uh, the uh, uh, the Somalis, for instance, are right now in some parts of Minneapolis are strong enough that they may soon be electing people to the legislature. Right. Uh, we have the Hmong in St. Paul who have been electing right. people to the legislature. Um, we have the uh, gay group mm -hmm. uh, groups that uh, are strong enough that they've actually gotten enough people in the legislature that they were able to create gay marriage. But we want to take away the vote. That's what this bill is going to do. It's going to take away the vote from the gays. It's going to take away the vote from blacks and Somalis and Muslims. It's going to take away the vote from the Hmong. Right. And say, you don't get to select your judges. Well, why shouldn't they be able to elect a Hmong judge or a Somali judge or a Muslim judge? Uh, just, I, I forgot to mention that we do have a congressman from uh, Hennepin County right. area who is a Muslim. So we're taking away their power. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's an incredible, I, I just can't imagine why, uh, it, it just strikes me as, as a, a horrible bill when you start talking about taking away someone's right to vote. Well, it gives, the, yeah, like you say, it's given that governor who the people elected, obviously the people were smart enough to elect the governor, but it, the governor then has taken away the, the right of the people to elect a judge who now all of a sudden aren't smart enough. Right. And what, <laughs> and what do we know about the judges that the governors appoint? We don't uh, know anything. We well, know very little. Let me, yeah, well, we do know some things well, about we do. those people. Okay. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> What we know is, is well, that the public somehow, doesn't. No, but the public doesn't. But what we know is that somehow they are friends, a lot of them, right. are friends or cronies of political the Political acquaintances. Pl political friends. Uh, campaign contributors. contributors. Exactly. Um, been on their boy, uh, plenty, plenty had one uh, who was his chief person to look in to find out who would be a good judge. And exactly. he goes, oh, I'm a good judge. Right. <laughs> Points so, himself to the Supreme Court. <laughs> so, so you have to say to yourself, what makes them, what makes those people better than somebody that the, the, uh, the, average, the public would elect? And it, it's, it's ridiculous. Well, and that's what a point that Bob Auden brought up in Washington County where they had 24 people, attorneys, run for a judge spot for an right. open seat. When there were 17 other seats that weren't open, but a judge, an incumbent judge, was running for them, not one person ran against an incumbent judge in that 10th Judicial District right. that, that I right. remember. Right. And, and similar things have happened in other counties. It's happened in uh, the 2nd Judicial District. Right. Uh, and, and, it, oh, and we yes. see it over and over and over again where there's an open seat, then the attorneys will run. Uh, and you know, it, it was kind of unusual to have as many as 17. But again, it shows attorneys will run for these positions right. if they think they have a chance to win. The problem with right. running against that word incumbent is you don't, most attorneys don't think they have any chance to win. When I asked a number of these attorneys running for this open seat, and I said, why didn't you run against, why won't you run against an incumbent? And they said, because the word incumbent, 
yeah. and because I'll be punished yeah. if I, I'll lose my cases. They will punish me. Uh, and that, it's just, that's another, that's an unwritten rule that they have, right? Right. right. Yeah. So, um, I mean, is that, do all these attorneys that are out there, do they, my understanding is they all know this unwritten rule. Is uh, that, <laughs> I mean, well, I'm not going to, Well, I don't want to, you know, put you in a box there, but what's your understanding on that? No, I, I, I think that's probably a pretty safe uh, okay. assumption. Uh, that is why I never ran for a district court position. I always ran for the Minnesota Supreme Court. Okay. Uh, even then, I got some district court judges very irritated with me, hmm. and I had to start removing, trying to remove them from cases. Uh, so you know they were acting out against you. Oh, they made it quite obvious in courtrooms. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But what did they do? Or oh, they they'd start saying, uh, s start talking after you know I'd handle something with my client, and they'd say, Mr. Wurzel, I don't like what you're doing. Wow. And, and just start talking about you shouldn't be doing this. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna degrade the law. You're gonna make uh, the judicial process uh, worse, and blah blah blah. And they would just go into an oration that would maybe go five or ten minutes. Wow. Uh, and uh, and then you have to go. Your client would say to you, "What was all that about? And and do I still want to you to represent me?" There you so, go. That's and so. Um, yeah, it, it, I lost some cases because of that. Yeah, I mean, and by lost, I mean I, I lost the client. Client, yeah, sure, exactly, absolutely. Well, and that's what the judge is trying to do. Perhaps, perhaps, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, we have another caller. So, caller, do uh, you have a comment or question on this issue of uh, this issue you bring up about whether the governor should appoint his cronies and his friends? and his campaign workers and his campaign contributors to the bench. I get the feeling that the, the people who actually run the government have no problem with it because they think it leads to governability and stability. I mean, I know we're all taught in school that judges are supposed to look at what law is and rule for the law and look for justice. But, I mean, in reality, aren't those... I mean, and I'm trying to figure out how you guys look at it as being legal scholars. Isn't that just an idealistic vision that you hope in the future will sometime get to that point? But in the practical terms, isn't the more important thing that judges look at is very practically uh, not these big ideas of what the law is or what justice is, but will this interfere with the governability of the citizens? Thank you. Uh, well, let me answer it this way. Um, I've practiced law for over 30 years, and mm -hmm. uh, we have some very excellent judges in Minnesota. Absolutely. Uh, we've also got some very bad judges in Minnesota. Absolutely. <laughs> and then the question becomes, and then we've got a whole bunch of mediocre judges. Uh, the question becomes, when you have an election system that doesn't work, mm -hmm. which is where we've been for right. 25, 40 years, mm -hmm. how do you get rid of the bad judges? And right now, we haven't an effective way to do that. That's, no. what, that's what I was trying to do, create an election system that would work so we could get rid of the bad judges. Uh, I don't care if, ju I, I've been in front of great judges who were appointed by Democrat governors. Right. Uh, and great and horrible judges that were appointed by Democrat governors, mm -hmm. right? And the same with Republican right. governors. Right, absolutely. And it doesn't make a difference. Some judges get what's called in the profession, the legal profession, black robe disease. Right. Uh, where they kind of let uh, let it go to their head that they're a judge, uh, and that's perhaps one of the worst problems mm -hmm. that's, that we have with the judiciary. And um, it doesn't make a difference where they came from. If they've got black robe disease, they need to go, right? Uh, because they've they've now uh, forgotten that they need to actually think a little bit and and uh, come down off their high horse and. Uh, start realizing what's going on in front of them and deal with people's real problems. And um, sometimes that sense of humanity seems to have uh, escaped them. <laughs> but, uh, but isn't that purposefully in place that we can't, there isn't the structure to get rid I mean, it's, it's a structure that's not in place to get rid of it. And I think that's purposeful to get rid of these bad judges. I don't think, I think they've intentionally designed this system 
to make it next to impossible. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah, it's it's absolutely positively constructed this to work this way, and a lot of the construction's been going on by your Minnesota Supreme Court, mm -hmm. uh, by the various rules, rules that they make, they yeah. create that make it very difficult for anybody to run, and then they also whisper in the ears of the legislature and get what they need as well. And one of the big problems right now is is that word incumbent, mm -hmm. uh, and now they're pushing this constitutional amendment. And again, the constitutional amendment is not going to Real, as far as I'm concerned, is not going to serve the, the public at all. It's going to serve the interests of the judges. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who want this. Right. Um, the, the public, I think, would be much better served if, if they could elect their judges. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one of the provisions in the uh, proposed constitutional amendment, uh, again, if you start looking at the structure of it, right. uh, is that there's going to be a committee that makes a recommendation to the public and that recommendation is going to show up on the ballot. Okay. There won't be anything else on the ballot but the judge's name. They'll and take off the vote. word incumbent. Yep, because finally. there's only one vote. So there's one only person. one person, you're either so voting you to, know they're the incumbent. Yep, and you're either voting to keep them or not keep them. And then you get the recommendation of this committee that either it's a good, that they should, that they would vote to recommend, that they suggest you rec vote to recommend or uh, get rid of. And Who makes up the committee? Appointees by the Minnesota Supreme Court and the governor. And, and, I think so, and I think some people from the legislature, and maybe maybe some people from the, who are pub, just members of the public, but have been right. appointed by the like the governor. You have to be appointed by these bodies. Yes. So they're all yes. political people. Right. Right. And which but, they call independent. But <laughs> what, what's so <laughs> disturbing about it is that the committee. First of all, you know that when, when voters have no other information, and they will have literally no other information other than what this committee recommends right. or doesn't recommend, uh, this committee is gonna become all powerful in terms of deciding who the judges are. The ju Judicial Evaluation Committee. Exactly. As whether you stay on as a judge or not. Yep, and if you look at what their criteria are, uh, Bob Auden made some comment about some of those criteria. One of the criteria is uh, a judge's punctuality. Uh, uh, okay. another, in other words, whether they issue opinions uh, in timely a, in a timely not. fashion. Okay. Um, and, uh, well, they, also show they, up on time to the court yeah. case. And, and, uh, I, I mean, suppose that too. And, and while those might be important, the one, the one criteria that is purposefully left out, in fact it says explicitly they are not to consider it, is any decision the judge made which is appealable. Mm -hmm. Well, every, almost every judge, every decision a judge makes from the bench is appealable. Is appealable. Right. So what Absolutely. they've really said is you can't consider the judge's actual decisions. So you could have a judge, I kid you not, you could have a judge who's punctual and gracious with the parties, but simply says, you know what, I refuse to follow that law. Or the, the Constitution. Law is, or, or the whatever. Constitution, or whatever it, it is, and therefore A loses and B wins, and even says that, and says it again and again, and we've got, by the way, we've got judges who actually do these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that guy could get a, an excellent recommendation mm -hmm. because he's, he's punctual and he's Gets timely. Gets his orders. All this kind of crap. Great demeanor in the Good courtroom. demeanor, yep. But, but, does not, but they aren't going to look at the fact that he's been overturned 150 okay. times. So that's the evaluation committee that goes and says... Uh, evaluates the judges that will be on the ballot yes or no this guy's got a good evaluation or not right okay then there's another committee then also that appoints that really tells the governor here's your guy well yeah they're they're, they're gonna have a another committee and I can't remember what they call the committee in the bill but basically this committee would rec make recommendations to the to the governor and I think they uh, are supposed to uh, select out uh, three names or mm -hmm. five names, and right. the governor is supposed to pick one of those. Mm -hmm. But it only applies to the district court. Mm -hmm. It doesn't apply to the Court of Appeals. It doesn't apply to the Minnesota Supreme Court. And uh, so uh, what's going to happen again is the governor's going to appoint his friends and cronies to those positions. Nothing changed. <laughs> huh. Now, you've talked about one big issue that I think Oh, I've heard you talk about this in the past, but this problem with the 14th Amendment if we pass this bill. Yeah. And so we're kind of, we're running out of time here. So this <laughs> You want me to try to explain this? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, All right. I think, it's, I think it's huge. Okay, if you read the uh, 14th Amendment, most people are familiar with 
with Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, which talks about uh, uh, due process of law uh, and those kinds of things. Uh, what you need to do is look at the next section of uh -huh. the 14th Amendment. And what it says is that uh, if it was meant to, again, it was done during Reconstruction, it was meant to prevent the states from restricting uh, how, uh, and trying to prevent blacks from having the vote. Right. And uh, what it says is that if a state takes any action which in any way infringes on the right to vote, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, of various offices, and among the offices listed, are judicial offices in the for, state. For the state, not? For the state. Yeah. Then uh, there's a consequence. And the consequence is that the state can lose its representation in the House of Representatives. In fact, that's, that's, it's, not, it's not a suggested consequence. That's the consequence. Wow. And if you lose your represent and, and go, understand what the practical consequence of that is, not only do you lose those votes, because you wouldn't have your representation, but this would also affect how many electors you get for as a state college. for the electoral college. So you wouldn't, your votes for president wouldn't count. Or exactly. it'd be, it'd be well, you'd, you'd still ex significantly because if you if you lose all your members of the House mm -hmm. of Representatives, you'd only be left with the two senators. So Minnesota right now has eight votes in the electoral or ten, because we have eight congressional districts. You'd you'd lose those eight, all right. and you'd be left with two votes. Okay. Uh, so this is a, a a real issue. People need to take a good hard look at the Fourteenth uh, Amendment, uh, Section Two. Uh, I've told this uh, to the legislature, and they don't want to listen to me. <laughs> All right, go figure. Well, Greg, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, and best wishes in your endeavors and uh, hope this constitutional amendment gets defeated. Well, we're out of time. Dan Severson's going to be on next week uh, running for Secretary of State. Please tune in then. And remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. We'll see you later. I see that you're long.